Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Really, what I always tell most people is, uh, you know, just buy a couple index funds. You should be looking at the S&P 500. And who wouldn't want to own a fraction of America's 500 greatest businesses? You know, <laughs> there's a lot of things that America does well and a lot of things it does poorly, but we do capitalism pretty well. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. What's the world's largest stock investing podcast? It's not this one, but a boy from the suburbs of Sydney can only dream. Joining me today is Sean O'Malley, the chief editor and financial writer for the Investors Podcast Network's We Study Markets newsletter, which of course is an offshoot of the We Study Billionaires podcast. How are you, Sean? Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for coming on. And um, I, I just kind of wished we recorded our conversation yesterday because it was almost like um, what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think I, we started diving into things and we realized that we should yeah. be uh, hit and record. But, you know, I guess that's just, you know, it's it's fun to just shoot from the hip sometimes and, and you never it know is. where the conversation is going to go. So hopefully we, yeah. uh, we have some fun today. Hopefully fun. So <laughs> tell me about starting investing when you were about 10 or 11 years old. That's not a very common, well, actually it is common. I found so many people that I interview on this podcast do actually have this kind of experience, but how did that work for you? What were your first stocks? Yeah, it's funny. I think I got really the itch for stock investing from my uncle. He was a banker and he'd always be watching CNBC whenever we'd visit him. He always had it on the background. And I think specifically he had on the show Mad Money. Uh, he would watch Jim Cramer. <laughs> and that's rare. You know, well, that I, was a I while ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah. And so, you know, I found it so fascinating this world of, you know, if you could be savvy about managing your own money, really the world is your oyster. And it, it felt like so many people work for money. And this idea that, you know, having your money work for you is like such a profound idea to a 12 or 13 year old or however old I was. And so, yeah, I actually just would have these kind of weekly conversations with him talking about stock investing and, and trying to keep up, you know, what he was doing. And I honestly probably mirrored a lot of his early stock investments. He would say, you know, as a banker, he would say, oh, you know, Bank of America is looking cheap or, you know, he would give me a lot of bank stocks, which are not the, you know, sexiest picks for a, a teenage boy. But I think that's where I got my start. And then I remember, you know, tracking it for a few years and then Fitbit had its IPO. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, an IPO, it's a you know brand new stock. And I somehow thought I was going to have this early investing advantage of, you know, surely all of Wall Street isn't, you know, following this IPO. And, you know, by watching uh, Jim Cramer's Mad Money, I, I have the inside scoop. And so, you know, <laughs> I don't I don't keep up with Jim Cramer as much anymore, but I really did watch his show every single night, probably through most of middle school and for the first couple of years of high school. And yeah, I, I recognize that was not a common experience for your, your average, you know, eighth grader. And I, I read his books and he was really kind of my gateway drug to the world of finance and, and investing. So, you know, to much as, as he is sometimes maybe mocked today, I, I really do owe him a debt for being the person who, who taught me a lot of the really basic concepts of how the stock market works and what even it means to, to own a stock. It's really good to, to have that someone like your uncle explaining these things for you because so many people have their first experience with the stock market going, oh, I've heard about this company. I, I, there's a great story there. Like you say, no one else on Wall Street's heard of this story. I'm going to buy this stock. And of course, you, you, know, you can often end up as the patsy. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was a privilege to have, you know, a trusted family member be sort of looking out for me a little bit to make sure I didn't do anything you know, too stupid or uh, too reckless or, or even to sort of manipulate me. And it's not lost to me that that's a, a privilege, you know, and financial literacy is not as common as it should be. And, you know, my hope is to kind of be <laughs> mentor is maybe too strong of a word, but I hope someone's, to be a someone's, similar... ga someone's gateway drug. Yeah, someone's someone's gateway drug to getting into finance and investing. And, you know, my hope is that for most people, when they go and sign into their uh, to set up their 401k for the first time, when they get their first job out of college, that they're not saying what is an S&P 500 index fund. If we can at least cover <laughs> the basics of what an S&P 500 index fund is, you're actually at a good place. You're probably ahead of, of the vast majority of people. And if you're confident enough to be doing stock picking, maybe you're dumb and naive, or maybe you're really sophisticated. But, you know, I, I think everybody has their own 
journey of what brings them into finance and investing. And you're going to make mistakes along the way. And that's just part of the process. But the more trusted voices you can have in your life, even people like Jim Cramer or people like my uncle, or hopefully even, you know, what I try to do in my newsletter or your podcast, you know, have people that are trying to look out for you and just give you their honest advice and giving you that room to make your own mistakes and learn from your errors. But also when you're ready to learn after you make those mistakes, having somebody who can give you that sort of trusted advice. It's interesting that you talk about an index fund and just even knowing the basics of that as being a perfect introduction into the stock market. And it is really, isn't it? Because you're learning about, well, first of all, what an index is and what S&P 500 actually stands for, for example. And then you can start looking into it and see, I mean, I know a lot of tools now give you a kind of look through into Mm. what it is constituted of. And that's such valuable learning experience, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. If you can explain simply what an S&P 500 index fund is, you're in a good place. I think that's a good general barometer of financial health. And yeah, so many people want to ask me about their stock picks. And yeah, you go out to a bar with friends and somebody's saying, you know, okay, should I be, should I be investing in Peloton right now? Honestly, (laughs) people expect me to have some sort of, you know, insider knowledge of it. This is the stock you should be buying today. And, you know, really what I always tell most people is, uh, you know, just buy a couple index funds. You should be looking at the S&P 500 and who wouldn't want to own a fraction of America's 500 greatest businesses. You know, (laughs) there's a lot of things that America does well and a lot of things it does poorly, but we do capitalism pretty well. We've got some pretty, great companies that know how to make money and setting everything aside as an investor that is exactly the kind of places you want to have your money invested and the companies that are among the best in the world at generating profits. So, you know, the S&P 500 is a sort of curated index that's, you know, updated quarterly and uh, you see some big changes every few years to reflect America's largest companies. So in many ways, you could do a whole lot worse than just owning the 500 biggest and most profitable companies in the United States. And I certainly encourage people to diversify internationally. But like I said, that's a pretty good starting place. And it's interesting being approached by friends in a bar that have a story to tell you. Often I'll get friends in bars saying to me, oh, what about lithium? You know, every EV is going to be requiring lithium. What about this company? Have you heard about this company? And of course, I've never heard of the company. And my first response to them is always, is this company making money? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is a concept that is very foreign to a lot of people. And I say, no, it doesn't matter if it's making money. It's about whether the price is going to go up and I'm going to buy it today and sell it to somebody at a higher price tomorrow. And, you know, the kind of financial jargon term for that is the, the greater fool theory, right? Of, you know, you pay a price and then you find some other fool to pay a higher price. And there's no bounded economic reality underpinning sort of what you're doing. And, you know, there's plenty of financial academic literature to to back up this kind of very simple statement that I'll say that, you know, a company's share price over the long term is driven by its earnings. And its earnings is a jargony word for its profitability. And so, like I said, whether you're investing in the S&P 500 or you're picking, you know, individual companies, starting from a place of looking at what is just profitable is a surprisingly simple insight that's really all overlooked. too commonly <laughs> overlooked. Yeah, it's it's really shocking. You know, yeah, yeah, like you said, you know, somebody will be pitching a, a mining company or a new tech startup and it's, oh, well, you know, they're pre-revenue, but they have this huge market opportunity. And it's like a pre-revenue. You know, I could set up a lemonade stand and be post-revenue. You're investing <laughs> in something that's pre-revenue. That's really seems incredibly early. <laughs> Sean, we've jumped straight in. Uh, Usually I go, okay, well, what's your origin story? But we've jumped (laughs) right into investing. So let's go back to your origin story. What kind of jobs were you doing before? You you studied finance at college and then moved into the finance industry and started making rich people even richer? Is that the the basis of it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that, that was the line I I told myself for why I needed to get out of my job. But yeah, you know, I had a a very basic finance degree, you know, was very interested in stock investing and thought that I was on track to be a a Wall Street all-star. And, you know, I was doing the the CFA, which is, you know, Chartered Financial Analyst exam. And that's 300 hours of studying and I passed a level one. And speaking of the S&P 500, funny enough, I I worked at a company called S&P Global, 
which of one of the things they do is produce the S&P 500 stock index. I was basically the guy who bailed out investment bankers, not to overstate the complexity of the work that I was doing, but S&P has this data platform similar to you know, a Bloomberg terminal, but they call it CapIQ or CapIQ Pro are the two versions of the platform. And so basically I was, you know, spent months learning to be a trained specialist and navigating their platform. And then I would go on and I would work with investment bankers trying to pull transaction comps on certain, you know, mergers and acquisitions or trying to value companies. And, you know, I would learn how to quickly go into their spreadsheets and figure out, okay, you know, this is the error with your formula. This is why the data is not pulling. This is how you should restructure it. So I learned a lot about the actual kind of financial modeling aspect that you might do in investment banking, but also just sort of the technical nuances of this uh, data platform that we were working on. And, you know, it was fun and exciting at first to feel like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, wasn't really working on Wall Street, but sort of Wall Street adjacent. And I had this very clear trajectory to probably making lots of money over the next couple of years. And it was a very standard path to go down. But as you said, it, it felt like, well, who am I helping? Well, I'm helping investment bankers. I'm actually getting paid a lot less than it, they are to in many ways do their job. And who are investment bankers helping? And you know, I'm not an anti-Wall Street guy. I understand the purpose that the financial system serves. But at the same time, you know, you realize you're enriching a lot of people at a lot of big banks and big companies and already wealthy people. And you're not really taking, um, even at a minimum, you're not sharing what you've learned and, and certainly not helping the average Joe. I mean, a subscription to the Cap IQ data platform that I worked on with these investment bankers is some you know $30,000 a year per person. The average person is not paying $30,000 a year. So you're already just from the beginning in this very walled off exclusionary world of you're only working with people who can afford a $30,000 membership fee. So it's almost like a country club of you know, financial data. Uh, you're, you're working with hedge funds and big investment banks that would buy you know, 100 or 200 subscriptions at a time and they would plug different teams into it. But there's certainly this kind of disturbing feeling that am I going to look back on my career one day and ask myself, who did I help and what value did I create for the world? And maybe I'll say, you know, I did a hell of a job doing a, a discounted cash flow on Apple stock that some banking team at JP Morgan is looking at or whatever. But what does that get you? You know, really, that doesn't create a lot of value for society, or at least for me, it didn't feel like it was something I would be very proud of looking back on. Tell us about getting in with the fast crowd at the Investors Podcast Network. I believe it was during COVID. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, thank you for asking. It, you know, it was a funny story where I found myself in the the world of COVID lockdowns and I'm looking around wondering, okay, you know what, how long is this going to last for? What, how am I going to spend my time? And when it quickly became pretty apparent that this may be an enduring weeks or months long phenomenon, I, you know, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to use my time at least somewhat productively. It's uh, very tempting to just be lazy and relax around the house and, and tell yourself, you know, kind of white lies about why it's okay to, to not do anything productive. But I told myself, I'm going to go for a couple walks a day. And I'm going to listen to some educational podcasts. So I started out on a walk with my dog and I searched just investing on Spotify and the Investors Podcast Network, which is the name of the company I now work for, popped up. And then our, our flagship show, We Study Billionaires, I started listening to it and I, I fell in love. I loved it. I, you know, I, I felt like I had a rekindled love for like value investing all over again in many ways, especially, you know, doing the CFA and learning to think Wall Street. And, you know, they're not talking about Warren Buffett and, you know, true intrinsic value of companies and long term ownership. A lot of it's very short term minded and, you know, it just, it's a very different way of, of thinking about investing. And so I fell in love with the We Study Billionaires podcast and I listened, you know, every week for at least, you know, two years. And then you flash forward to 2022 and I see an advertisement for a YouTube host position of all jobs with the Investors Podcast. And I thought, you know, I don't know anything about YouTube. I don't think I have the personality to be on YouTube. I don't think I have the face to be on YouTube. I don't, you know, all, all of the insecurities, all the, you know, whatever. And, you know, I said, I, I got to get in with this company. I mean, this is my dream. I, I've been, you know, listening to these shows for so long. I saw it almost in many ways as a ticket out of the, the kind of trap of working a nine to five for the rest of my life. So I threw a Hail Mary and I sat down and, you know, I wrote a lengthy email applying for the job and filmed these videos that were in hindsight were, you know, were horrible or laughably bad <laughs> of me trying to pitch myself as a YouTube host. And so, you know, I, I meet with our, our company's <laughs> co-founder, Stig Broderson, and, you know, he's not impressed with me at all. You know, we'd go 20 minutes into the interview. He tells me I'm too Wall Street. I'm too formal. I'm too corporate. I take myself too seriously. And I just said, you know, I, I got to hit the reset button. I, I'm, I'm starstruck 
you know, speaking to the person who has, you know, really changed how I see the world of finance and investing. I mean, we had a heart to heart conversation after that. And, you know, I, I guess he was willing to give me a second chance. And he kind of said, I'd like to keep in touch and I'll hear from you, you know, again down the road. And I thought it was a very polite way of telling me off. And I was thinking, you know, I really wasted my opportunity here, my chance to break out of the corporate life and work my dream job in many ways. And, you know, funny enough, he followed up and he goes, hey, I'm not going to hire you as a YouTube host, but you know, I, we have this stock investing guide that we need somebody to write. I'll let you do that. Take a crack at it. I did. I guess I did well enough that he then said, hey, you know, we have this email list and we're looking to build a daily investing and financial markets newsletter. I'd like you to be the person to bootstrap it. So I, I joined in 2022 and I've spent the last year, you know, doing just that, bootstrapping the newsletter. And now I work with a wonderful team of of writers and, you know, we're, we're very proud of the work we do. And, you know, ultimately it boils down to just trying to teach as many, you know, non-financial professionals about how the financial system works and how it impacts them and, and why a lot of this very esoteric Wall Street stuff may actually, you know, matter to them. And it's so great that we're living in this era now where so much information is available from podcasts, from newsletters like yourself, and that um, investors actually can get the very basic knowledge that they need to start investing. And it's like we were saying before, you don't need to you know, there, there's certain kinds of people. If you're going to be investing in individual stocks, you've got to do a lot of work and a lot of research. But even understanding where your 401k is being invested or what an ETF is, so that you, you know, an index ETF, for example, or even being able to watch out for what may be common mistakes. Um, are there any mistakes that you've seen people making or have you had any contact with people via the network that have shared their mistakes and <laughs> oh man, and, and how they could have done things a little better? <laughs> oh boy, so many mistakes. <laughs> uh, you know, There's a, I, I think- a plethora of mistakes. You know, I, I'm sure I could come up with some specific ones, but I really think just the general phenomenon of what we've seen in markets the last couple of years with especially this bubble in 2021, I, I feel like that really hit me at an informative age. You know, when I watched these people around me, especially kind of being, you know, everybody, I, I was the guy that, you know, I was their one stock investing friend or, you know, finance nerd. And, you know, hmm. people would come up to me and they're day trading options. And I'm thinking, what, what do you do? You work in insurance? Wait, what? You know, you, you sell cars? Why are you, why are you day trading Tesla options? You know, and it was some sort of almost, you know, it's funny because I'm sitting here telling people how I, I want to teach them about investing in finance and managing their money well and, you know, ethical ways to do this stuff and being disciplined. And you would think on the one hand, I would be so excited to see more people engaging with investing and even trading. But no, I mean, it was actually very disturbing because I see people and I, I realize, you know, I barely know what I'm doing with options. I, I understand the basics, but I know enough to know that I shouldn't be messing around with them more than on sort of an experimental basis. And I, I see friends that are putting, you know, huge chunks of their net worth into options that expire in two weeks. And, you know, it, it, that was actually, you know, it was very disturbing to me to know so many people who were kind of being very reckless with their money. And it was this bubble psychology. And, you know, I actually did some things that I regret that were, you know, semi-reckless with my own investments. Even though I should have known better, I felt the pressure. I know if, knew a friend who made like $5,000 on Dogecoin. And I'm sitting there thinking like, I know better than to invest in Dogecoin, but you know, what other crypto projects maybe should I throw a couple hundred bucks at? Or maybe I should be, you know, buying Tesla options. And what, what is this crowd phenomenon that everybody seems to know that I am missing out on it? And I, you know, I actually worried that I had some financial hubris where I thought I was, you know, too good to take advantage of some of these opportunities that were low hanging fruit to make money. So it was a really interesting experience to live through, to realize that even despite everything I've learned and many of you know, the, the great investors that I've studied, I'm just as fallible as everybody else. And I didn't make any critical mistakes, but just feeling that side of me come out where I could capitulate to the kind of groupthink of, uh, you know, maybe I should buy some Tesla stock or, you know, maybe I should pile into XYZ trending and investment of the day. And I mean, it, it was a, a nationwide phenomenon, you know, GameStop. I was in the, um, the, I would go in the Wall Street bets forum and, you know, not because I was seriously following it, but it was just such a fascinating kind of real-time case study to see these people. And, and you know, talk about 
good stories of mistakes that people made. I mean, every day I would go in there and it was somebody made a million dollars and somebody lost their entire life savings. And, you know, one story really popped out to me where, you know, a fellow had said that they took all of their student loans and they took all that money and rather than using it to pay for tuition, they poured it into like Tesla options and they lost it all. You know, and, and they're sitting there saying, you know, how do I pay for school this semester? How do I get more student loans? And, and they were going to try to take the next round of student loans and take that money and then try to win back. And, you know, it's just it, it was a, it was kind of a gross phenomenon, really, in, in many ways. A lot of people, despite the markets generally rising so much over that period, there were a lot of individual investors that tried to go all in and they just got burned. Are you confused about how to invest? LifeSherpa can ease the burden of having to decide for yourself. Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. LifeSherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. Investing in shares can be fun, but the paperwork isn't. My investing's been transformed since using ShareSite, the best portfolio tracking tool for investing. My portfolios are on ShareSite. And whenever I buy or sell, the trades are automatically recorded. I can see the dividends I'm receiving, and it helps me to work out my asset allocation. ShareSite are extending a special offer to listeners of this podcast, four months free on an annual premium plan. There's a seven-day free trial where you can experience the full power of ShareSite portfolio management. Go to ShareSite.com slash shares for beginners and sign up now for a free trial before taking advantage of four free months. That's ShareSite.com slash shares for beginners. I interviewed Spencer Jacob, who's a, an editor at the Wall Street Journal, who wrote a book on that particular subject. I can't recall the name straight off. Sorry, Spencer. And, but what he was saying is that in the end, Wall Street still won because they make money clipping the ticket. So they didn't really care, you know, whereas all of these Redditors and uh, bored apes were thinking, oh, we're getting one up on Wall Street. We're, you know, sticking it to the man. But in the end, there was just increasing the amount of trading and the increasing the amount of money that was flowing through the conduits of Wall Street. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. The amount of times I would go into Wall Street bets and read about how they were going to stick it to some hedge fund. And the reality was, like you said, they were just, you know, feeding market makers and these sort of intermediaries who are market neutral and they just benefit from, you know, increases in trading volume. And so, yeah, you know, I think one or two hedge funds blew up but it was kind of a shark feeding frenzy for 99% of the rest of the space. So yeah, you know, there, again, there was a cruel irony to it. And there was this very romantic story, especially going around Wall Street bets, where a lot of these folks were saying, I lost everything in the 2008 financial crisis, and I'm going to stick it to Wall Street. And fortunately, that's just not how it works. Even if you, you know, they would target these companies that were very heavily shorted. And yeah, sure, you know, maybe you, if you could somehow do pull off a short squeeze like you did with GameStop, maybe you can blow up one hedge fund, but you know, there's a dozen others that are going to be market neutral and they're going to, you know, just be printing money because of all the, the increased trading volume. And, you know, it, it's a very crude way to try to take on Wall Street, you know, and, but like I said, it was romantic and it was very noble to read these people telling these stories about how they lost it all in 2008. And this is their chance to, to stick it to the man. And I would ask, you know, who, what man are you sticking it to, you know, and, and what does this accomplish? And, you know, people would have no problem wiping out their life savings just as to kind of prepare perpetuate this narrative. And like I said, it was, it was a disturbing thing to watch, you know, especially, you know, kind of knowing enough to, to know what was really happening. And God forbid you try to speak up in the Wall Street bets forum, you're going to get shot down. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> so you just kind of had to watch this, you know, slow moving accident happen in many ways. Let's get back to the safe world of value investing. <laughs> I've got a bad taste in my mouth after thinking about all of mm. that. So you consider yourself to be a value investor, but how has your experience being involved with the podcast network changed your view of value investing? Mm, it's a great question. You know, and, and in many ways, I think that, you know, a, a naiver version of myself would have told you the only real way to make money in stock investing is to be a value investor. And honestly, in the time sense, you know, I, what our podcast company does every week is we interview, you know, many of the best investors from around the world. And a lot of them are not, you know, pure value investors. They have very different ways of making money in financial markets. A lot of people don't trade with anything to do with equities, right? People trade commodities and people trade volatility and there's all different types of, of trading strategies. So I think as I've learned about more different ways to make money in financial markets, as even a day trader, which is kind of a dirty word, but there are, you know, actually legitimate ways to, to sort of do that. 
that, or as this kind of romantic, you know, long-term value investor, there's a lot of ways to make money. And so I try to be a lot less judgmental, I think, of other investment approaches. And when something's working, I'm really curious to try to figure out what exactly are the factors driving this success and how much is this attributable to randomness and luck. But, you know, there are these very real psychological phenomenon that drive uh, asymmetries in markets. And, you know, for example, you know, momentum trading, you know, there were plenty of people that rode the momentum wave of the, this bubble I'm talking about in 2021, you know, 2020, 2021. And if you know how and when to get out, a lot of people made money doing that. And that's not my risk profile. That That's a game I don't know how to play. And my skill set is personally better suited for the kind of value investing ideology for investing. But, you know, really the biggest takeaway for me is not necessarily about value investing specifically, but just being humble and honest about the fact that there's a lot of different ways to make money in markets. And who am I to cast judgment? You know, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm a value investor and better than other types of stock investors and traders and people in other financial markets. And it's just not the reality. If you know know how to reliably do what you do to make money in markets, I mean, that's valid. Because a lot of people start uh, taking on some of the nostrums of Buffett and Munger, Mm. and they start spouting the quotes and they think, yes, well, I'm a value investor because now I've used these quaint little sayings that I've heard. But I think you've sort of also seen, and especially with We Study Billionaires, because the guys are talking to a whole bunch of people who've made money. And it's like you say, there's all sorts of ways of making money in the markets. And uh, yeah, just speak to that for a moment. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's a certain snootiness to value investing. You know, like you said, where you quote these sort of very colloquial things that Buffett would say, and don't get me wrong, I have as much respect for Buffett as, you know, anyone in the world. I, I went and saw him in Omaha speak with Charlie Munger this year. And it, was one of the, the highlights of my professional career. But you know, at the same time, it does bother me when I, when I see people just kind of throw out these very generic expressions that Buffett may use and or maybe even misinterpret the context with which he said it. One interesting thing about Buffett is that the investment that he's made the most money on in his career from a kind of a nominal total amount of dollars perspective is from Apple. And that's a company that many for years would have called a tech company and he would have, you know, avoided investing in entirely. And so in many ways, he is far more flexible and dynamic of an investor than a lot of people give him credit for. People say he would never invest in tech and maybe Apple isn't a tech company, but I don't know. They produce a lot of great technology. So Buffett himself has learned and evolved over time. And I'm not telling anyone to go dive into tech stocks that they don't understand, but we do live in a different world. And a lot of, you know, where Buffett started out with was inspired by uh, his mentor, Benjamin Graham, who would do, uh, you know, the expression is cigar butt investing, where you would pick up these stocks on the side of the road that had one puff left and you'd get the last puff out of them. And they'd be, you know, often companies and in dying industries and you know, manufacturing or maybe even literally the tobacco industry, you know, some dying industry like that. And, you know, they would still have a couple more years of profitability before the industry entirely slipped out underneath them. And you'd buy up those companies and throw off a ton of free cash flows for a couple of years. And you might be able to get some sort of mean reversion and, you know, you make a few bucks on it. But his start wasn't the sort of long-term own great high quality companies for many years that people sort of associate with him now. And so he's had multiple of these inflection points in his career. And I would challenge a lot of the people today who maybe blindly is a harsh word, but sort of blindly follow the teachings of Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett to consider being uh, as flexible in a rapidly changing world. You know, Adam Cecil, I believe, uh, wrote a book called Value Investing 3.0. And, you know, the very premise of the book is that value investing needs to be updated for the, the modern world. And when you look at how counting system works and how companies are valued, a lot of the time that, you know, they'll have these very valuable and tangible assets. They'll have all this software and code that they've built up over the years because some of the nuances of the accounting system, rather than being lasting assets on those companies' balance sheets, those are actually expensed. And so, you know, many of these great companies like Google and Facebook and Apple for a long time looked really expensive on paper because, you know, rather than these investments that they're making in R&D being capitalized on their balance sheet in the same way that that 
a manufacturing company who invests in a, a warehouse or whatever, the way that might be reflected on its balance sheet over 20 years, a lot of these investments in software were being expensed immediately. You know, it was basically like, you know, it was lost value altogether. So the, even just there, there's some failures of the modern accounting system to really capture what companies are worth in the 21st century and, and how to value this very, you know, digitally native economy that we find ourselves increasingly moving into. So he's been a great influence on me and uh, I, I've really enjoyed reading his book. And I think he is probably touching on a very important inflection point. And, you know, again, like I said, I would just encourage a lot of people to be honest about what they don't know and humble about it and, you know, be willing to be flexible, to think about how the world is changing around them and, you know, whether extrapolating lessons from, you know, the 1940s with Benjamin Graham are still appropriate. And again, there's some um, incredible fundamental truths that I, I wouldn't want to disregard or have people overlook. But on the other hand, there's just some technical aspects of markets that are, are very different now. That is interesting to dwell upon the fact that you've got to actually give yourself a reason not to buy a company. I think it's too easy to look at the good side of a company, look at the story and say, oh, this is a great story. This one's for me. But just to understand how much time Warren Buffett spends reading annual reports. And I just wanted to also say something else that I've been looking at is free cash flow and trying to understand free cash flow a lot more. Because as you say, companies have changed. And do you believe then that free cash flow does give you a more accurate view of how well a company can go in the future, even if it is putting a lot of money into capital expenditure to grow for the future? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, free cash flows are the sort of oxygen of a business, the money that is really coming in the door for a company to operate successfully. Kind of what I was talking about before, where you can get these accounting manipulations with how companies' assets are capitalized and whether certain things are expensed or not. You know, net income is very much an accountant's number. It's manipulated in many ways. And that was, you know, something I spent a lot of time studying in the CFA exams is learning all the different ways you can manipulate net income. As a corporate CFO, you can manipulate net income in your favor on a quarterly basis. And it's a very short term thing to do. And you can put off making certain investments and drain down your inventory stocks and do stuff like that, where, you know, you can say, oh, yeah, you know, look, our, our net income is higher today. And you're growing, you know, profits at 4% every quarter, you know, whatever it is. But in reality, you're kind of creating a, a paper tiger that is something that's not durable and lasting. And so free cash flows are, are really the foundation of any company. And if you have positive free cash flows, you can continue operating. And it's certainly one of the, the first things I look for. And of course, look at net income. But at the end of the day, you know, my eyes are, are going to, to look at free cash flows. So many companies these days are software as a service um, organizations. And of course, they can have a lot of money coming through the door, but the cost of acquiring new customers means that the profit is, can be impaired for many, many years. So is this a way that you use to look at a company like that, that would be beyond what you would say as a traditional value investing metric? <laughs> yeah. I mean, software companies are tough. I, I won't... I won't pretend that I'm an expert in, you know, software tech investing. I probably read that book on Adam Cecil and I, I found it very interesting and, and more from, you know, or less from a vantage point of thinking, you know, wow, I, I know so much about how tech companies work that I'm going to be able to invest in them profitably. But again, to kind of this point that we we're talking about earlier, there's so many different ways to make money investing, even just within the niche of value investing, there's very different schools of thought of how to make money, which is really interesting to me. The more... I learn about the software business, I can see why a lot of these companies are worth the extreme valuations that they are because they have such low operating costs and there's no frictional cost to selling another unit of Microsoft, right? Uh, you sell another unit of paper, you've got to pay to produce that paper and maybe you're spreading out your fixed costs and getting you know, some economies of scale, but there's still those variable costs. Whereas with the digital world and software as a service programs, there's really no variable cost, maybe a little bit of computing power and electricity power on the margins, but it's so extremely negligible that these companies can scale at in a way that was, you know, literally unprecedented a few decades ago. And that's why, you know, we saw the dot com era boom in the 1990s. And, you know, it's not that investors were wrong. They were just early. Wall Street was really excited about these 
incredible margins of profitability and, and, and ability to scale that companies could have that was, like I said, just really unprecedented before. So on the one hand, I often look at these tech companies and I feel like, wow, these are some incredible prices to be paying. But then on the other hand, you have to question you know, whether you're using the right metrics to evaluate what they're worth. And like I said before, you know, the price to earnings ratio is, is manipulated. And especially if you're doing something like a price to book value, you know, a, Google is going to look infinitely expensive on a price to book value. And you would have, you know, not invested in it over the last 15 years. And you would have missed out on one of the best performing stocks of all time because of that. Because like what we talked about before, you know, book value in a you know, company's balance sheet does not necessarily do a good job, at least, you know, how accounting standards exist today, capturing what a, a modern software based company is worth. Mm. Okay, well, we might leave it there. It's been great chatting with you, Sean. Hopefully we can get you on the podcast again. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Phil. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope to be back on soon. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future.